for the collector and district magistrate of Madna had been built in 1882 in a 20-acre compound. After 1947, occasional magnanimous collectors had donated a few acres here and there for the district offices of the Rehabilitation Department, a housing colony for government servants and a cooperative bank. The house had 22 rooms. Most collectors used about seven. The rest were silent and stored official furniture discarded by successive families. The smallest room, the office, and called, for some reason, the camp office, was the size of the government flat in Delhi which Srivastav would get if he was posted there. Vegetation had thrived for a century in the compound, and in the stone walls of the house, acres of old banyans and pipples inexorably burgeoning, rapacious for more space, groves of guavas and mangoes, even national treasures in the form of two sandalwood trees, of which fact the collector had to notify government. Some of the families tried agriculture too, but of course, none of their sweat ever dropped on the soil. The gardeners on the municipality payroll were summoned to the house and made to plant paddy and potatoes and cabbage. Some collectors who did not carry the belief in the dignity of office to any pompous extreme even made good money on the sale of rice. In a, develop in a developing country, we must never waste food, they explained. The first 50 meters around the house had been demarcated for a lawn by an ambitious collector who had had no idea of the difficulties of gardening in a vast oven. Usually, the first 10 meters looked sufficiently green even in May, but the next 40 were on a no man's were a no man's land, as it were, between the lawn and the wild. It looked like no man's land too, an unsettling reminder of what Madna really was beneath the efforts of its residents and, go and their government. Madam Collector liked to stroll on the lawn in the evenings with the children. The weather was almost pleasant after sunset. Besides, she was a little scared of the house after dark. There were two foxes in the compound, so she swore but she preferred the possibility of their company to that of, un of the unknown. For she swore too that there was a ghost in the house. She had heard mysterious noises. No one ever disagreed with her, partly because the house was vast enough for flesh, blood, and the spectral. spectral. Partly because in a life ineffably dull, a ghost meant a little rom romance. Shrivastav's children quite liked the house and were intermittently curious about the other rooms. Mrs. Shrivastav liked the house in the day because it was cool. Shrivastav himself was completely dead to its beauty but liked its systems for the supply of water. He was a practical man. Kumar, the superintendent of police, loved the house for beneath his lard lay a squashed romantic, but he never admired it too openly. For he, feared, for he feared that his words would be misconstrued to be the envy of the police for the magistracy. Agastya liked it because it looked majestic. Menon admired it because it represented accurately the steam in which a collector should be regarded. When they reached in that evening, huge bats were drawing a pattern in the, in the twi twilight sky. Mrs. Shrivastav was fat, friendly, and surprisingly sexy. Throughout the evening, Agastya kept looking at her thighs. He thought he saw her marriage perfectly. It would have been about seven years ago, in the Asma Ganj. An IAS officer would be revered almost as much as Krishna, so Shrivastav must have made about five lakhs on the deal. But she called him Ravi, and in two of the photographs in the drawing room, he had his arm around her so their marriage was tinged with modernity, wherein wife could call her husband by name, though she probably didn't do so when they holidayed at home. In casual conversations over the months, most of his surmises of the first, most of his surmises of the first evening regarding their marriage were proved correct, except that her dowry had been not five lakhs, but seven. Shrivastav turned out to be that ghastly thing, a teetotaler. He was in kurta and pajamas and tickling his two children on the divan. The children were shrieking. They seemed to be insane with ecstasy, without ecstasy too since they shrieked. Clearly a hereditary trait, thought Agastya, romped, fought and bawled without cause month after month. 
Augustia could see the panties of the six-year-old daughter, rather pretty, and looked bashfully away at the thighs of the mother. Sit down, both of you. Malti, this is Sen, the new IAS. And Shrivistav returned to extracting shrieks from his children. Augustia had a faint notion that he was trying to create an impression. Look, by day I am the collector of Madna, but by night I am a family man. Menon was of course familiar to the house, but behaved all evening as if the ghost had gone up his arse, jumpy because, eager to please, but not knowing how. Yes, I have heard about you, but I can't call you Sen. That's for my husband. Here a half smile at Shrivistaf. Augustia was reminded of Joshi's room on the first day and Ahmed's voice dropping to a hush to pronounce Mrs. To all the admission of conjugality seemed a cause for embarrassment. What's your full name? Mrs. Shrivistaf was wearing a black bra beneath a yellow blouse. Augustia sneered at Menon, startling him a little. That would be hilarious dress sense in Trinity, but it's okay in Madna, no? Augustia, half ready to answer the next question with, It's Sanskrit for one who turns the flush just before he starts pissing, and then tries to finish pissing before the water disappears. That's even worse. Most Bengalis have such difficult names. Mrs. Shrivistav had a nice smile. I'm sure your parents or friends don't call you that. What do they say? Ogu and August. He thought of lying but couldn't immediately think of anything but obscenities. He laughed. She laughed. August. That's nice. August? asked Shrivistaf, abandoning his children who scrambled off the divan and crowded around Augustia. Perhaps you would prefer another month? asked Augustia silently. A menial with haunted eyes entered carrying a tray of Kampa Cola and Nimbu Pani. Augustia wanted both but restrained himself to the latter. The daughter hit the servant in the stomach and screamed, I want rose sherbet. Shrivastav screamed too, Ice, Gopu, ice. You've been told a thousand times that when you serve drinks, serve them with ice. Is there no ice in the house? Sir, then why haven't you brought it? Sir, Gopu left for the ice looking a little more haunted. And you're from Calcutta? Yes, ma'am. The boy, who was four, suddenly seemed excited by Menon's face and began laughing loudly, clapping his hands and racing around the room. Shrivistav tried to shush him. What does your father do? She's trying to be friendly and to put me at my ease, thought Augustia, so he decided to be charitable and not lie. He's in the government, ma'am. I see. In which department? asked Shrivistav, trying to prevent his son from taking off his own shorts. He was in the Indian Civil Service, sir. He's now governor of Bengal. Madhusudan Sen? squeaked Menon. Your Madhusudan Sen's son? The ghost had lovingly patted his balls. Surprise and awe had pushed him to the edge of his chair and widened his mouth and eyes. He's had a fantastic record. He's been Home Secretary and Chief Election Commissioner. And when he was made governor, some people objected. But he was never an, in, an insider to Bengal technically. He spent all his years in the Bombay Presidency and in West India. To whom was he talking? Augustia wondered. But just, as the, but just the recital of the record of a successful bureaucrat seemed to provide men in sufficient excitement. So your mother was Goanese? He married late. She was the daughter of some subordinate of his, and there was a bit of romance, wasn't there? Now he'll tell me, thought Augustia, on which days in February 1953 my father didn't brush his teeth twice. Of course, the officialdom of Madna came to know of his father very soon. Sen Saab is son of Bengal governor moved from many mouths to many ears, and his attitude is slanted marginally towards the sycophantic. Augustia was an IAS officer and the son of a governor. Madness seemed to consider itself fortunate that he was with them. 
When they next met, even Sati said, You didn't disclose your lineage to me last time, and laughed. Menon was stopped only by the shrieks of the collector for the servants. Gopu! Ram Singh! Now Shrivastav had, to use, of, uh, to use officialese, reversed his decision and was taking off his son's shorts. He's urinated in his shorts. Shame! Shame, Shahar! At your age! Free of the incumbents of his shorts, the boy then raced around the room, emitting short shrieks of joy and suddenly stopping, stopped in front of Augustia, pointed to his penis and explained, Piro comes from here. Gopu! Ram Singh! These bloody servants, I'm going to send them back to the office. Men and got up too, forced from the recollections of the career of an idol to the immediate concerns of his immediate boss. The servants always go and smoke beaties beyond the kitchen, and it's such a big house that they can't hear from there, said Mrs. Shrivistov. In her voice was embarrassment at Shrivistov's anger, pride in the sizes of the house, and relief that the servants did not smoke beaties in the kitchen. The corridor was almost directly opposite Agastya. He saw the servants before Shrivistov could. They strolled around a corner into sight, sharing a beady. Ram Singh scratching his own balls while Shrivastav and Menon continued to shriek for them. Gopu trampled on the stub, then both began running, ending in a close finish into the room, panting like defeated marathon men. Shrivastav shrieked at them in the lingo for a few minutes. Menon stood near them menacingly. The screaming, kicking child was handed over to them for a change of dress. His sister waved to him from her chair and said, Bye bye, Piddler. Gravely, near the door, by the bo near the door, the boy bit Ram Singh's cheek. These servants are impossible," said Mrs. Shrivastav. They were actually peons from the office. Many peons, officially government servants, did the domestic chores of successive collectors. Many coveted the job, preferring to clean the shit of the progeny of a collector than to shuttle files in an office. Their priorities made sense, for in the office the collector was a million rungs away, but a home while they were bringing his shoes or taking away his slippers, they were close enough to grovel for their desires, for a little land, for the expedition of a government loan, for a peon's post in some office for their sons. Their fathers and grandfathers had done much the same, but the skins of those collectors had been red and the accent of their English alien. Of course, they shrieked at home as much as they would have shrieked at office. If any madam collector was unreasonably tough, they worked even less while waiting to be shifted back to the office. Yet not many were sent back because they introduced in the gossip their, in the gossip their facets of the collector's personal life. Collector Saab shat thrice yesterday. Bad stomach. Madam collector sometimes wears whisper black panties yes the contract was implicit but clear the collector and their wives believed vehemently in the dignity of labor so did most of madna believe that one's social standing was in inverse proportion to the amount of one's own work that one did oneself and it is easier to believe these things when one's domestic servants are being paid by the government the other party to the contract the peons believed in the indignity of labor too. It is part of the Indian story. But they also knew that the goodwill and help of superiors are much more important than beliefs. Antony, my predecessor, transferred one peon to Rameri because that fellow had refused to work at his house. He came to me a few days ago saying, Sab, bring me back to Madna. I'll work anywhere you like. You see, now he's feeling stupid because everyone is calling him a fool for having missed a chance to work at the house. No, Ravi, please don't talk about your office, smiled Mrs. Shrivistaff. Why don't you instead ask Sen, no, August, what Kumar was like today? Agastya wondered how she knew and said hurriedly, Oh, he was fine. We talked a lot. Kumar is an Indian police service specimen. They're all jealous of the IAS, said Shrivastav. You must also call on the district judge Mishra and the district development officer Bajaj. Bajaj is another specimen, a bloody promotee. 
A promotee was one who was not recruited to the IAS through National Civil Services examination like Shrivastav, Menon, and Agastya, but promoted to the cadre from something lower, the regional civil service or the engineers. In Shrivastav's vocabulary, promotee was a vile curse, ranking somewhere between bastard and motherfucker. Bajaj behaves like a promotee. You will see. The Indian Administrative Service has a work ethic. These other fellows have none. Shrivastav scowled a lot here. If the country is moving, it is because of us only. He meant exactly what he said, and Agastya felt very embarrassed. But not all of us are that good, sir, said Menon, beaming. Mr. Antony, for instance. Aha, uh -huh, thought Agastya, bitching session. Ha, huh, Antony, scowled Shrivastav and ruffled his daughter's hair, who pulled her head away with a ch of irritation. Shrivastav turned to Agastya. You know, this Antony fellow behaved like a promotee, took the curtains of this house away when he left. I wanted to complain, because at least an IAS officer shouldn't behave like this. Otherwise, where's the difference with the others? But I didn't complain because there must be a solidarity in the cadre. Agastya wondered why Shrivastav didn't change the shape of his sideburns. May I bring my books and study here? asked the daughter sweetly, feeling perhaps that she should be paid more attention. Certainly not, snapped Shrivastav. You'll just mess up the room and disturb everybody. Just sit here quietly. The daughter ejected a few silent tears. When that didn't work, she ran bawling to her mother who asked her to shut up. Otherwise, she would be sent away to her brother. Then Ram Singh came in with a closed and beaming shakar. Ha, ah, the piddler has come, said a smiling daughter. Mrs. Shrivastav took both away for their dinners, much to their dissatisfaction. What was your discipline, Sen, in college? English, sir, said Agastya, and wished that it had been something more respectable, physics or economics or mathematics or law a subject that at least sounded as though one had to study for its exams. Many times in those months, in a myriad forms, he was, feel, he was to feel embarrassed about his past and wish that it had been something else. Sitting in Shrivastav's drawing room, he remembered Putakaku's objecting to his choice of subject in college, just as he had earlier, and for much the same reasons objected to Augustus' schooling. Chaucer and Swift, what are you going to do with these irrelevancies? Your father doesn't seem to think that your education should touch the life around you. A useless subject, said Shrivastav. Unless it helps you to master the language, which in most cases it doesn't. He scowled mysteriously at Menon. The English we speak is not the English we read in books. And anyway, those are two different things. Our English should be just a vehicle to the communicate vehicle of communication. Other people find it funny, but how we speak shouldn't matter as long as we get the idea across. My own English is quite funny too, but then I had to learn it on my own. Agastya began to like Shrivastav then. He was honest, intelligent, and satisfied with his life. He was rare. In Asmaganj, where I come from, I studied a Hind in a Hindu medium school. Now people with no experience of these schools say that that's a good thing, because we should throw English out of India. Rubbish, I say. I, rubbish, I say many other things are far more important. I know by. There is not a single good teacher in these schools in these smaller places. How can there be when their working conditions are so bad, when they themselves pass out of such schools and colleges? When I went to college in Lucknow, I felt completely stupid, so I began to read English on my own. I had to, because English was compulsory for the civil services exam. So I read Shakespeare and Wordsworth and people like that. Very difficult. It's still important to know English. It gives one, he fisted his hand, confidence. Shrivastav had the pride of a self-made man. Agastya had rarely met them. In his own world, most people made it because of the people they knew. 
He could visualize Shrivastav too, an obscure and mediocre college student, sweating with incomprehension, but determinately wading through the prelude because he wanted to get on. You are what you are, just as English here too is what it is, an unavoidable leftover. We can't be ashamed of our past, no, because that is to be ashamed of our present. People curse our history because it is much easier to do that than to work. A bat flew into the room. Shrivistav scowled at it. It left. That a young man in Asmaganj should find it essential to study something as unnecessary as Hamlet, that is absurd, no, but also inevitable. And just as inevitably, if we behave ourselves in three generations, it will fade. They spoke of many things that evening, of course. Most of the topics were selected by the collector. He was a knowledgeable man, and neither at home nor in the office could he display his grasp of subjects beyond his work. He held forth on the Constitution, the reorganization of the states, the elections, drought relief, the nature of politics in the region, the dem democratic system. When Mrs. Shrivestaff returned, looking a little tired because she had been putting the children to bed, Shrivestaff was letting them know his views on the importance and inadequacy of education in India. Ah, education, smiled Mrs. Shrivestaff. You should ask me. No one did, so, it, so she explained to Augustia. I teach in the Janata College here. I've done my M.Ed. from here too. Mrs. Shrivestaff was one of a kind of one of a one kind of wife to a collector. Their further studies depended entirely on where their husbands were posted. While the husband worked, the wife gathered degrees from the sad colleges of the small towns. It was not easy to refuse admission or a degree to the wife of a collector or a district development officer or a superintendent of police, even if their previous degrees were from places that the principal of the college was not sure existed. Indeed, he was hardly bothered by these petty matters, knowing full well that the earlier colleges Mrs. Collector had graced could not be worse than his own. Thus, when Shrivistav had been an assistant collector at Lutchuk, Mrs. Shrivistav had become a master of arts at the Lutchuk National College, and when the husband had been district development officer of a having Haviliganji, the wife had become Bachelor of Education at the Haviliganj Gandhi Graduate College, and now a Master of Education at the Janata College, Madna. But these wives used their degrees well for brandishing them with pride, justifiably, because the degrees indicated, if not their level of education, at least the force of their husband's clout. They returned to those colleges to teach the rubbish they had learned. It was even more difficult to prevent them from teaching because that would mean depriving the collector's family of a good monthly sum. One could say that these bright young officers invested well in the education of their wives. The wretched college gained too, people said. It is a good college. Madam Collector teaches there. So I have been busy wherever Ravi has been posted. He smiled at Mrs. Shrivista. Come, let's go for dinner. At the table, she asked, how's the rest house food? Very bad. You must eat with us whenever you like. No formality. Just treat this whole place as your own house, okay? Thank you, ma'am. He ate with them almost every day. He would walk across at about seven in the evening, down the long drive from the gate that was continually being threatened by the banyans, race with the children to the lawn, fascinate them with the contents of the other rooms in the house and the blood-sucking habits of the bats. They particularly liked children who piddle in their pens. It's the smell. After which Shipra, the daughter, cackled all evening, listened patiently to Shrivistaf and chatted inanely with his wife. They provided a welcome domesticity. He heard Shrivistaf rant against the methods of his predecessor, that Antony fellow offered tea to anyone who came to the office, a silly populist measure, and a very bad precedent. The office tea bill just shot up and extolled the virtues of their job. He sensed Mrs. Shrivistav's pleasure at being first lady of the district. He accompanied them to places to an evening of gazals. Of course, the show didn't start until they had taken their seats in the front row. To the club, after each visit, Mrs. Shrivistav would whine against those who had not got up from their seats at their entry, and Shrivistav would say, 
What to do, Mauti? It's the culture of the place. Over dessert, a lovely ker, which Mrs. Shrivistav didn't have because she said with a smile that she was getting too fat, which was true. Shrivistav said, In your training, you will move from office to office trying to learn what each office does. Most officers will tell you nothing because they are uninterested, lazy, incompetent, or just too busy. Just keep your eyes and ears open. That's the only way to learn. Later, do you play badminton? Helps to keep trim. Shrivistav was almost as fat as Kumar. We play every morning at the club from 6.30. Come if you want to. And when he and Manan were leaving, tomorrow I'll come and visit your room and see what they have given you. He did come and scowled throughout the visit. It was official. But it was a shrewd and responsible move to ensure that Agasti was treated well at the rest house. Where's the rest of the furniture? The sofa? I asked him to take it away, sir. I didn't need it. But how will you entertain by? When people come to your room, where will they sit? Shrivistav stalked around the room and Agastya wondered if he was looking for marijuana. Do you want to shift to a flat? Agastya wasn't sure. He would be away from the rest house phone and fridge. He would have to organize furniture and a kitchen. Far too much effort for just a few months. But in a flat, at least he would have escaped Vazant's meals. Vazant's children were at the door. They had been drawn by the white ambassador with its orange light, but the driver had prevented them from crawling all over it. There were many, and Agastya wasn't sure if Vazant had fathered all, but they did look similar. Small, thin, black, with large, quick eyes and open mouths, their liveliness transcending their malnourishment. Agastya interested, interested them profoundly. Whenever his door was open, they would peek in, giggle, and scamper away. Shrivistav glared at them, and they looked at one another and giggled. I have assigned a peon from the office to you. He comes every day? Yes, sir. And he added silently, sits outside, farts, smokes, beaties, and dreams up impossible requests for me to forward to you, all because I can think of no work for him. Vasant appeared with tea. Shrivistav blasted him in the vernacular for a while. Just telling him to feed you well, he explained. Pursue RDC about your language tutor. Without the language, you will never survive. And you have to pursue these things because even RDC, like the rest of these fellows, would rather die than do any extra work. Because to die means more rest.